Well, welcome everyone. I'm very excited to be here today with Jennifer Acker, editor of The Common. Thank you so much for joining us. And how's it going, Jennifer? Nice to see you. Good, good. I'm in beautiful snowy Massachusetts right now. I just, you know, <laughs> shoveled six inches off my car and oh, um, wow. so feeling invigorated. <laughs> so you're at home nice and cozy with us. That's great. Well, welcome. <laughs> uh, welcome to all of you. As always, if you have any questions, just go ahead and type them into the chat and I'll work them into the conversation. Uh, so let's jump right in. Jennifer, do you want to tell us about the history of the magazine? Are you the original founder? And when did you found the common and why? And tell us, take us through all that. Sure. Um, so um, yes, I am the original founder. Um, so I'm the founder and the and the still and current um, editor-in-chief of the magazine. Um, we launched in 2011, uh, so this is our, um, we're, we've been around for 13 years, entering, um, entering our 14th year. Um, the magazine looks like, this is an older copy, but the magazine looks like this, for those of you who may not have seen it in, uh, in person. Um, and so, and it has pretty much always looked like this from the, uh, from the very beginning. Um, the magazine, the, the whole orientation and mission of the magazine um, is to publish work with a strong sense of place. Um, and so the place theme is really the most, um, is the thing that uh, most people know us for and that um, is the most important aspect of the magazine. It's what sets us apart from other literary magazines. And that sense of place um, focus uh, came about because, um, um, I I noticed uh, at some point. Can you just open it? Um, yeah. At some point in my reading life and in my in my literary life, um, how important the sense of place was to me as a reader, um, and just how much place had shaped me as a person. So I'm from a very small town in Maine, um, kind of place where people know each other. It's very much shaped by um, by the physical environment. Um, you know, there's a particular main accent, there's a way that people talk to each other, like it's very distinctive, like no one would confuse my town with some other town, like in Iowa, even though there might be a lot of similarities there, it's distinctive also. Um, and so it's, at some point when I was thinking about starting a magazine, I was, I was realizing my own taste towards reading things that had a very strong setting and also sort of noticing the effect that place had had on me as a person and as a writer and, um, and as an editor. Um, and so I, I also felt that, so I felt that we needed, um, you know, some sort of literary venue to have these conversations about place, about what is home, what is a way, you know, how does that distinction arise? Um, you know, what does it mean to be from somewhere? What does it mean to be placeless? You know, maybe you are an immigrant, maybe you have been displaced, maybe you are living in exile. So there are all sorts of ways that um, that place shapes the contemporary world. And we now have more, you know, more migrants, you know, moving around the globe than at any time since World War II. And, and, and that's been true for a while. Um, so I was I was thinking about those kinds of you know the importance of place and in that way, as well as changes to our environment to the natural environment, as well as the um, the rise of digital culture. Um, so all of these forces you know back in like 2008 2009 uh, when I was thinking about starting a magazine made me want to create a forum to talk about place and for people to express that through literature. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's that's sort of the um, the impetus for the sense of place um, mission. Should I, should I pause for questions? Like um, I, I don't want to just go on and on. You can certainly go on and on. <laughs> I have plenty of questions. I'm sure others do too. But if you have more, you can you know certainly. <laughs> Um, no, no, I think the only other thing to say is that, um, you know, is that we are a print magazine, you know, we publish, you know, um, um, a lot of things online and we have a very vibrant website and we, you know, we, we are a part of the digital world as, as much as I am a reluctant participant of it. Um, the common itself, um, has reasons for being part of the digital world and that, is so that more people can read it. You know, we want to be accessible. Um, we want the work that we publish to be accessible. We publish a lot of 
work in translation. Uh, we want original authors. Uh, you know, we want authors and their uh, you know home communities to be able to read the work that we publish. Um, so we in fact have no paywall on the website, um, and uh, we know we publish this beautifully curated print um, edition. Um, which is a wonderful object, um, but we also want to be, you know, open and and you know, read um, as much as possible, and to not have any barriers to access. Sure, that's great. Thank you for that. Um, so I hear people talk a lot about setting as a character. Like they'll say, "Oh, the setting in a particular piece was so strong, it felt like its own character." Is that something that you sort of look for in a strong work? Yeah, yes, for um certainly. Um I mean to be honest, I have really never known what that meant. Mm. You know, that's that setting is you know acts like a character, but um but I guess I, I do understand that or the the way I the way I think about it is just that um you know the setting is so important. If the setting were different, it would be a different story. Like something, you know, something about the story would have to change. Um, this the setting is so particular and so important that um, it, the, this this whatever actions are happening in that story couldn't have taken place anywhere else in the exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. um, so th that is sort of the way we think about place, and place could be uh, it can be a real place, it can be imaginary place. Could be set in the future, set in the past. Um, it could, you know, a place could be a tiny hospital room, um, or it could be an entire town, or a whole country, or you know, what, what, uh, whatever the author's ambition is, and whatever they can sort of successfully render. That's interesting. Do you think of uh, like psychological spaces as places, or is it pretty concrete in terms of what you're thinking about as place? The psychological does come in, uh, certainly, um, and so, um, so and you know the the body, you know, can can be a place, uh, and sort of sort of depends on how the author does it. But we do we have a very capacious understanding of place and try to um, try to go at pieces with the the most broad understanding about that of that when we're reading for selection. Yeah, that's interesting. I So I didn't realize that you would consider something like a hospital room as a place. Like when I think of your magazine, I always think of like the woods. <laughs> <laughs> You're like something very <laughs> outdoorsy or something like that. So what would an author need to do if they, let's say they set, um, you know, the whole piece in a living room, what would the piece need to have to make it right for the common, to make it like a place-based piece even though it's set in you know a kind of mundane place mm -hmm. yeah um and so i i think that if you know whatever the setting is we're looking for the setting to be palpable and you know the, the setting to be so there there's a reason why we say sense of place because the senses are important in rendering a particular place um and the, the senses you know one could argue are actually what uh, what creates a place, um, you know, or our understanding of it, like the way that a, any given space becomes a place is through our sensory perception of it. So I'm speaking right now in this room, I can hear the, you know, how, how large the room is by how my voice sounds in it, by how echoey it is or not, or where does the, where is the sound bouncing off of you know, I have a sense of, you know, how warm the room is by how it how it feels on my skin. I have a sense of how big it is by like, well, it's bigger than my two arms stretched out to the side. Um, so that's all a bit sort of academic y, but um, but just to say that the um that this rendering the senses is it brings you a long way towards giving us a, a strong sense of place. And then, you know, if you are setting something in a living room, just thinking about what are the opportunities and constraints of that space? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you know, it can only fit a certain number of people. So you couldn't have like a town meeting in your living room, probably, unless you lived in a very tiny town. Um, but just sort of what are the what are the things? How do you how is that space being used to, to further the story or to show us who the people in that story are? Mm -hmm. 
Do you ever get tired of reading submissions dedicated to space? I always wonder like when editors have a magazine dedicated to one particular topic that you're seeing so many submissions with space as a theme. Are you ever kind of like, oh my God. <laughs> um, no, because they're so different. I mean, people yeah. have, you know, uh, there's an there's an infinite way, I, there are infinite number of places mm. and an infinite number of ways to render those places and to have them make it, you know, uh, to have them have those places have an effect mm. on the characters or the action or the voice or, um, you know, or, or any of those things. So I would say, no, I, I never get bored of reading about places because, um, you know, each individual has a particular relationship uh, to a place and that's generally not duplicated, you know, mm -hmm. the, and um, and if the, the writer is good, um, then, or if the writing is good, um, then it's going to be unique. Um, mm -hmm. And we're, even if everyone is writing about the same living room, like if everyone on this call was writing about the same living room, I, I, I bet it would be different, you know, for each person, there would just be a different set of emotions Mm -hmm. um and descriptions being uh being presented so so no not not bored yet <laughs> good uh can you take us through uh just brass tacks like what do you publish what genres um when are you open for submissions and how many submissions do you typically get per submission period mm -hmm. um so we publish all the standard genres short stories poetry um essays um, those are the, those are, and, um, and some sort of, um, literary or cultural criticism, um, th we publish all those genres, um, in print. Um, and then on the website, we have an expanded variety of, you know, of columns that we publish. Um, one is our dispatches column, and this is a good thing, um, uh, for writers to know about because they're short pieces. We get the fewest submissions um, to this to this column. I'm not sure why, because I think dispatches are so much fun to write. Um, but dispatches are short evocations of particular places, and they can be either either poems or or essays. We don't publish fiction in that column, but it could be either nonfiction or, or poetry. Um, and it's a great way to break into the magazine. So if you you know if you're itching to write about you know, uh, you know, a hike that you took or like a visit to see your grandmother in Estonia or, you know, some, something that is um, something that has a, you know, a particular place angle, that would be a great column mm -hmm. to try. Um, so online dispatches, we publish interviews, we publish book reviews, um, we publish a, a more visual feature called the, stu the studio feature. Um, and... I hope I'm not missing anything, but that's that's the gist of it. Okay. Um, we pub. Let's see. Um, our submission period is twice per year. It's in the in the spring and in the fall. So it's generally like March first to to June first, and then September first to December first. So we're open for about three months every spring and every fall. Um, unless you are a subscriber, but the perk of being one of the perks of being a subscriber is that you can submit year round and also the submission fee is waived. Um, what, were the, what were the other components of that question? Oh, do you have a, um, the numbers on how many submissions? Oh, I am terrible at the numbers of submissions and it changes sometimes. Um, but um, I am better at knowing the percentages of, pe of pieces that we accept, which are not encouraging numbers, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't submit. But uh, we publish sort of like less than 1% of all the fiction that we receive, um, about 7% of the poetry and maybe like 10% of essays. Um, um, so can you take us through your editorial process? What happens, piece comes through submittable and what happens from there? Yeah, um, so pieces come in, um, then they are read um, by a team of readers. So we have a, we have a, a team of volunteer readers, uh, which are composed of, you know, everyday people who are readers, who are like passionate readers, voracious readers. Um, they apply to become readers for us and, um, and they're sort of our our first tier. Um, some of our interns who um, 
who worked with us are Amherst College students who are interns on the magazines. They also are in this group of, of first tier readers. Um, every piece is read by at least two readers and they're read blindly. Um, and so even though, um, you know, you should still write a nice cover letter, but I wouldn't spend too much time on it. At the, at the, first, at the first level of reading, um, no one is seeing your cover letter. They don't know your name. They don't know anything about you. It's just the piece itself um, that, that's being read. Um, so that gets, so each piece gets read twice um, by two different readers who leave us comments and then the editors uh, come in and review the comments um, and begin sort of reading and sharing uh, the pieces that the readers were excited about or that, um, or that the editors have selected themselves. Um, and so nothing gets rejected um, until it gets to the editor level. Okay. Um, and we have a question about uh, word count. Um, can you just quickly tell us, is there a word count for prose submissions? Not really. Um, I mean, we would be hard pressed to publish something longer than 10,000 words in print, um, just because that's very long. Um, but we have done it. You know, we have published a few things that are um, that, are that long. Um, you know, if you're writing something that's on the longer side, you just want to make sure that the length is is merited. It's that it's necessary for uh, for that particular piece. But um, but generally, no. We actually in online where you actually could do unlimited space, um, we actually tend to publish shorter pieces of fiction. Um, some a lot of flash pieces or fiction on the shorter side. Um, know I, I think it's our belief that people tend to read longer when they're not so distracted um mm -hmm. so the longer pieces tend to go in print right okay um and do you solicit pieces from poets and authors whose work you would like to publish sure yeah mm -hmm. um yeah yeah i definitely do that um i go through sort of phases where I'm soliciting a lot and then, you know, and then phases where, um, where I'm soliciting a little bit less, but, um, but yeah, no, I do that. Also, we get agent submissions. So agents are sending us things as well. I think um, when people hear that they get nervous that the work from the slush, the slush pile isn't um, necessarily being read as carefully as work coming through agents or work that's solicited, do you have a sense mm -hmm. of which um, that gets published in the magazine comes through the slush pile? Oh, do I have a sense of what, how much? Like how much, uh, so the work that comes to you from uh, just in submittable, I know yeah. not everybody likes the phrase slush pile, but sure. <laughs> for lack of a better term. So <laughs> the work that comes through you uh, that way, not agented, not solicited, not anyone that you or the other readers or editors know, um, is that work also considered, uh, you know, in the same way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so it doesn't, um, I mean, the, the, the unsolicited pieces don't come directly to me, whereas agented pieces do come directly to me, but, um, um, but I'm not always the first read even on those agented pieces. Like sometimes other people in the office are the first read on the, you know, um, on the agented pieces, uh, you know, as well. So I would say it 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 certainly takes longer to go through submittable because of the volume of submissions that you know that that we're receiving, but pieces are not getting any less attention. They're in fact getting more attention. Mm. Um, they're getting you know it's they're getting read by by more people. Um, but we are not at all dismissive of unsolicited pieces. We're very excited about them. We publish um, a lot of writers who we are you know who are thrilled to have published. Um, and um, who, you know, who we didn't know of before and that, how else are we going to get to know new writers is, mm -hmm. is unless we're, unless we're reading, you know, the unsolicited um, uh, pieces. So we get very excited about that um, and absolutely, you know, put, um, see that as a real place um, to, to find things to publish. It's not just like, oh, we have to read this because, you know, we told people we would. Um, that's great. Um, and we have a question about book reviews. So what is the process if somebody wants to uh, write a book review? Should they send you the whole review? Should they pitch the review first? Um, and do you publish unsolicited book reviews? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're very interested in, um, uh, in expanding our pool of reviewers. And the thing to do would be to send a, a pitch to our book reviews editor, whose name is Nina. Um, 
And um, you can do, we just, we have an email for that. It's just book reviews at the common online.org. Um, so you can just send um, a pitch to her um, and she will, she'll take a look and see whether, you know, see whether it fits and, and then, yeah, and then get back to you. Um, so if you encounter a great story, but the element of place is not strong enough in the story, will you reach out to that writer and encourage them to revise? Will you accept the story and work with them to draw out those elements or how do you handle that? Yeah. Um, yeah, so some, something like that. Like if there's a story that we really love, but the place is a little latent and we feel like if it were stronger, it would also make the story stronger. Like we don't want to engineer a P like an author comes to us with a brilliant story, but there, there's no sense of place. Like we don't want to manufacture something just for the sake of trying to get it to fit our magazine. Maybe it's just not a good fit for us. And then we, and then we have to let go of it and that's okay. And that, that happens. Um, but if there is a place that does seem relevant and interesting, it just, you know, isn't heightened very much, you know, or, or you know, or, or could be, um, could be heightened more to the benefit of the story, then certainly uh, we'll go back to the author. Um, that would be just part of the normal editorial process. We do a lot of editing uh, and very in-depth editing uh, with our authors. So we're really reading for, for promise and for potential rather than polish. Um, and so we'd much rather see, you know, um, an exciting idea or a really strong voice or a, a situation that we haven't seen before, or just, you know, a compelling cast of characters or strong poetic voice. Um, you know, we'd rather, we'd really like to see that and then work with the author on developing the, um, the story. I mean, obviously you should make it as good as you can before sending it out. Um, but we really relish the opportunity to work with um, to work with authors and do that um, pretty regularly. That's sort of um, uh, one thing that we do that a lot of magazines don't do is that sort of pretty heavy editorial investment. Yeah, I was just thinking that actually a lot of lit mags don't <laughs> don't want to do that at all. So that's cool. So um, so what would make you what is the story that you would take on? Um, on that basis of promise? Like, what is it that you see in that story that would make you take it on, even though it's not quite ready to publish? Yeah, so, I mean, I think it would be a story that captivated our, you know, our interest um, and that the the characters were, um, you know, were, were tangible and plausible and, um, and you know, we could, uh, we were interested in them and want you know cared about them and wanted to see what you know what what they did and how how they did it. But maybe um, maybe the story sags in the middle, like maybe it, it, maybe it's a little long, um, or maybe there's a question of motivation. Like we really like the arc of that story, but I can't quite understand you know um, why the school teacher flunked her student. Like I thought that that that, that was a good student. Like, you know, if there are just sort of questions about about plausibility or motivation, um, you know, we look take a strong look at the ending. Sometimes the ending doesn't, you know, doesn't always land quite as quite as strongly as we think it might. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so we really can go a, a lot of rounds with uh, with an author if we think that um, if all of those other elements are are there, the place element is there, the and the writing is really strong. Um, and um, and we feel, you know, but, but it's a conversation with the author. We would go to the author and say, we think we, this is what we love about the story. This is how, how we think it's working. This is what we think it's about. Um, just to get a sense of, to portray how we're reading it. Like, you know, this is, um, this is how it's coming across to us. We think these elements could be strengthened. What do you think? Hey, do you, do you, does that, does that resonate with you? Do you, do you want to work together? Um, most of the time people say yes. Not always. Sometimes the visions don't align, and and that's fine. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, what do you think makes for good writing about place? Because I know, um, you know, a lot of people think sometimes like the setting gets boring. <laughs> so how can I guess this applies particularly to prose writers? Um, how do you make setting come alive? How do you make setting and writing about place be more than just static description? And how do you, do you have any suggestions for writers to how to, how to really use place in, um, as kind of like an active element in the work? 
Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good question. Um, yeah, I, I am not endlessly entertained by long paragraphs of description. Um, and so I, I wouldn't say that I, I have a, I, I do have a keen interest in it, but it's not necessarily what I'm looking for. You know, I'm not looking for someone to spend pages telling me what something looks like. Um, I think, um, you know, re remembering that we have more than one sense. So mm -hmm. mo like most people focus on sense of sight. Um, but remembering that we have four other senses that are also really important. And so you don't have to spend sentences and sentences talking about how something feels, but, or how something smells, but those are really important. So I would say first focus on all your, all your senses and see what they can do for you. Um, um, and then I would sort of think about like what and if we're yeah if we're talking about about prose like what the what the characters um or even po poetry too but like what the effect of the spaces on the characters um so that's really what we're most interested in is like how is this place shaping the action shaping the people um shaping the mood and so you know really thinking about um, how the space is affecting those people and what what they're noticing. Just by telling us what someone is noticing, you're telling us something about that person. Um, so sort of thinking hard about those those details um, is a, is a way to make the setting both particular and important. Yeah, it's really interesting. I remember uh, um, I read somewhere that the setting is shaped by the character's desire. So what it, whatever mm -hmm. it is that the character wants, that's sort of what they're seeing and noticing around them. And that just, it changed my life. <laughs> just hearing, you know, because it's not meant to be just sort of static. You know, there was a tree, there was a river, there was a sun, you know, it's it's part of the character's world, as you, as you said, right. it's part of the character's desire, their motivation. There's something actually like an active engagement there. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, question, how important for the common to publish international writers? Uh, very important. Um, so we, yeah, um, we publish a lot of works in translation. Uh, we have a, uh, that was one thing I forgot to mention. We actually have, we have a translations column. Um, and so we're publishing translations, you know, at the very least once a month um, online, but then, you know, often translations you know, make their way and into print also. Uh, so we're very interested in international voices and work with a lot of translators That's great. all over the world to try to, um, you know, get those voices into the magazine and to present them in a way that they are sort of um, aligned next to all of the pieces written in English so that people, you're not really differentiating. Mm -hmm. um, you're not approaching something with that feeling of like, oh, this is going to be different because it's not from my native language. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, hopefully that helps broadens people's ex reading experience a little bit. What do you see a lot of in submissions? If you could tell the writers here, <laughs> like, guys, please stop, you know, just starting with a scene description or whatever it is. Like, is there something that you see a lot of in the submissions that you could tell people about? Um, the only thing that I that I can really think of because I, I I'm not reading the the first tier of of submissions so much in, um, uh, anymore so I'm not getting I, I'm not the best person to answer that question because I'm not seeing the patterns in the same way that that some other people who are reading a, like a larger volume um, of those pieces um, I'm not seeing what they're seeing but because we are a place based magazine we have gotten a lot of kind of travel writing type pieces. Like um, I went to Morocco and this is, you know, what I saw. Um, and that could be a great essay. I'm not saying it couldn't, um, but um, but it needs to have a little more than like, I went to a place that was not my home and saw some things that were different from what I usually experience. Mm -hmm. So like that is the potential starting point for an essay, but it's not the whole essay. Right. Um, it has to be, it has to be deeper than that. Mm. Sort of relatedly, what are common reasons for rejection? Um, I would say, um, you know, if we are very confused mm -hmm. about what's going on, um, we are probably not going to publish it. Con confusion is, a, is so various editors have 
more tolerance for confusion than I do. I have very low tolerance. <laughs> so if I am confused, <laughs> I get kind of mad. Um, and I'm more inclined to stop reading it, you know, if I just like, I can't really figure out what's going on. Um, so, um, and confusion can come from like missing information or information that's not clear. Um, let's see what else. Um, I mean, if it, if it is a very, if it's a very familiar setting and very familiar characters and a, you know, a very familiar set of actions, then you're working sort of against yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we, you know, we want to see a high degree of particularity, you know, anything that, you know, you know, this as a reader, anything that seems generic is probably not really worth reading. Um, mm -hmm. So you want to really shoot for something that that's sort of highly particular to those people, those that place. Um, you know, certainly if it doesn't have a strong sense of place, um, that would be, you know, uh, we were obviously always, you know, looking for that to make sure it's a good fit for the magazine. So, um, so yeah, probably those things. Um, for nonfiction pieces, do you welcome photos as part of the submission? Uh, yeah, yeah, very often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can just include them in the Word document um, to give a sense of um, of how they would flow with the with the essay. Um, so can you take us through a recent piece that was accepted from uh, submittable slash pile, whatever you want to call it, and maybe talk about the process it went through, why you accepted that particular piece, what qualities it had that really made it stand out? Um, yeah, yeah, there's a there's a piece that I often use as an example. Um, it's um, by a, a writer named Noor Naga, um, and she is an Alexandrian writer from Alexandria, Egypt. Um, and she submitted a piece to us um, uh, called Arabs on the Beach. This was some years ago, but, um, and it was so striking because it was like an investigation of language about the term Arabs and like who that refers to um, and who it doesn't refer to. Um, and so that was that was of interest to us. It was a very personal story, you know, about visiting, you know, about visiting her grandmother who lived in this, you know, in this particular complex. But it also had um, an outward eye, and so this eye was really looking carefully at the surroundings, um, and was really looking carefully at the lives that were not hers, um, about the, you know, the the lives of the workers of this compartment, you know, of, of this um, compound uh, where her grandmother lived. Um, there were some, you know, there were some quotes in there from anthropologists about the use of the word Arab and about sort of looking at, um, looking at particular social contexts. And so there were, there was a lot going on and you might think that there was a little bit, you know, too much, but she successfully wove in all of these elements, the personal, the political, the anthropological, the descriptive, um, in a way that we just thought was really fascinating. Um, and so there was, um, there was a, you know, there was a level of explanation, but it was never didactic and it was really just, it was an exploration, um, in a way that really took the reader along, you know, mm -hmm. on, on, on this personal journey. So, um, yeah, I, I still love that piece. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of the fiction and the nonfiction, I guess, too, um, do you publish experimental pieces or does it lean more toward character driven? I would say it leans more toward realistic and character driven, but certainly not all. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why it's good to have many editors and, you know, and, and not just one. So, um, you know, one of our prose editors um, is a poet. And so her, she leans, you know, much toward, more towards um, um, towards hybrid essays or towards essays that are not maybe as explicit as I would want them to be in my very literal mindedness. Um, and so the way that she approaches pieces, you know, gives us more, um, I would say formal experimentation. 
Um, and then our managing editor, is, you know, is, is interested in speculative elements and how those might, uh, you know, come to play. So some of her favorite pieces are ones that, you know, take place in fantastical places, um, you know, or, or have some speculative element. A lot of our interns are interested in, in that kind of writing also. So there's a, there are a whole lot of, you know, tastes and different tastes that are, that are contributing uh, towards what, you know, to what we select. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really healthy um, because you have to defend what you like. Um, and then we end up publishing a broader variety um, of work. Mm -hmm. Sure. Is there anything in particular that you want to see more of in submissions? Um, I mean, I, I always say this recognizing that it's very difficult is that I really enjoy reading reported pieces, um, you know, um, reported essays or, you know, pieces that have some element of reporting, even if it's like the piece that I just described where it's just like, you know, you're interviewing your neighbor kind of thing. Um, but I recognize that that is hard to do for a literary magazine, like reporting often requires resources and the common is not able to fit the bill for you to go on a reporting trip, you know, uh, so unfortunately. Um, uh, but I do, I do enjoy that element quite a lot um, mm -hmm. in, the, in when we do get pieces. Um, we have a question about your poetry editor's taste. <laughs> um, it's pretty broad. Um, I think if you read the poetry in the magazine, you'll see that he published, you know, he publishes everything from um, uh, from very formal, um, you know, or people who, who are on the more formal side, like Mary Jo Salter or somebody like that, who, you know, who, who is like a little bit more strict with form sometimes, um, to pieces that are, you know, very experimental and are very prosy or, you know, or, um, um, or they're visually experimental on, on the page. So, so his his taste is pretty broad. I would say there I have there's there's no kind of poem that he doesn't like. Um, so, and, and I think he's very in interested in in breadth and variety. Yeah, um, I've noticed uh, the common has kind of a long wait time on the writer's side of things to hear back for a submission. Can you tell us <laughs> <laughs> why that is? A little bit about what's going on on your side. <laughs> um, it's just very high volume. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's just hard to keep up. Um, and you know, we have had a little bit of, uh, you know, the the people who were sort of assisting with reading those the uh, with with that with those cues. Um, there has been a little bit of turnover there. Where people have had to step aside for family reasons or something. So, you know, it's really just sort of like. You know we're slow because we're running a magazine and we're trying to keep up with reading the queue, um, uh, and sometimes, yeah, there are sort of personnel changes. You know, where people are um, you know sh shifting and and moving around. But um, but we 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 are working hard to catch up. Um, and so I think you know over the last couple of months we have made a lot of progress, both the fiction queue and the nonfiction queue. Um, and we will, you know, we're working on, on, on getting better. Sure. Um, do you have any policies if a writer receives a rejection letter, do you want them to wait six months before trying again? Um, should they just keep trying? Do you have any great stories about writers who were repeatedly rejected, but then kept sending you work and then one day something clicked? Yeah, absolutely. That happens all the time uh, that people send us pieces, you know, and, you know, the first and second piece aren't right for us, but the third one is. Um, and so, yeah, there's there's no waiting period. If you get a if you get a rejection letter, you know, you can send us something the next day as long as you have something that's ready. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, you know, especially if you get an encouraging rejection, that's a very serious expression of wanting to see more work from a writer. Um, and um, and I would say, yeah, just keep sending. Mm -hmm. um, no, no reason, uh, no reason not to. That's great. Um, so do you have any advice for writers? Let's say they're hearing this or thinking this sounds great. You know, I think I have a piece that's perfect for this magazine. Do you have any advice in terms of what they should look for before they hit submit one final read through any particular, you know, something like, oh, I see so many stories that start too late or start too early or double checking mm -hmm. ending. 
Um, just something where you see a lot, you know, stories that are almost there. If only this writer had done this one thing. Mm -hmm. um, any suggestions like that? Um, well, the, I mean, the first couple of pages definitely are important. So, you know, I don't think you can go over the first couple of pages too many times. And if you find that you're making smaller and smaller changes, then probably you're done. Or, um, and I know this is really hard to do because it's it's very hard for me to do. Um, but if you can set the piece aside for, you know, at least a week, um, you know, ideally long enough that you have forgotten you've written it, um, then I think that's the best check. You know, if you can, if you can, if you can bear to set it aside for a month, three week, three or four weeks mm -hmm. and come back to it and give it a read, uh, with fresh eyes or read it aloud to yourself or, you know, do something to make it, make it different um to your make it unrecognizable to your brain um then i would say that's like that's the thing to do that, that's the that's the final check um yeah. it's just is, is putting it aside that's great um so what's on the horizon for the magazine do you have any contests coming up any uh open reading periods any uh issues coming out soon um we actually will have a contest coming up it is not announced um so i can't share any details about it because we've never done a contest before so um this will be something uh brand new so keep an eye out for that um we have a call for submissions coming up for a pretty a special portfolio about um uh sort of that about writing coming from mainland china um post 2008 um so that's a you know very particular that's a very niche thing but um you know we're hoping to catch um uh, catch some writers new to us with that call for submissions um but um yeah nothing else particular coming up you know we always have portfolios um you know that focus on a particular language group or a particular region and we continue with those um that's sort of more on the reader side, but on the on the writer side, I would say submissions should open March first, so you can polish up your pieces between between now and then, um, and then uh, get ready to submit in March. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned volunteer readers. If somebody is listening to this and they decide they want to get more involved, how should they go about doing that? Yeah, yeah, you can send an email to our, our fellow, um, um, which is just info at thecommononline.org um, and just express interest. I, we usually have something on the web on the website about volunteer readers. I mm -hmm. think it's under opportunities at the common or something. Oh, great. Okay. Um, so we should have something there also, but you can always send an email and say that you're interested in reading. Um, and um, and then there's usually a little bit of a wait time because we're sort of full on readers, but then, you know, people are um, usually within six months, someone is sort of rotating off. So there's a space. That's great. Um, so one final question. This is a question I ask all editors, um, which is just what keeps you going? What keeps you doing this work? I know we're all busy. We have our own writing, families, jobs, all this other stuff. Um, and it's a lot to take on. So what keeps you excited about Lit Mag work and your magazine in particular? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think literary magazine work is exciting because we're on the ground floor. Like we're publishing people who go on to have um, exciting careers. And um, I love publishing people at the beginning of their careers. I mean, they're certainly not all early career people that, that, that we publish, but that's, that's one of the excitements um, is doing that. I love working with authors. I mean, that is the most fun part of the job. Um, and so um, there is a sort of thrill of discovery, but for me, that's not as exciting as actually working with people, like actually working with an author on their piece and hearing what is important to them about a piece and then like thinking together about how to how to make this piece best execute those intentions um, and just having those, those sort of in-depth uh, conversations with people um, and then just the work on the page and sort of communicating through, you know, through attention to, to words on a page, um, is the best. There's, yeah. there's not, there's nothing better. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today.
This was so fun. Thanks, Becky. I hope it was enlightening. It was. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. Nice to see you. Thanks, everyone.